Well, everyone, hello, and we're on to another lecture. And we're going to start off with something called phylogenies, which is more or less the art, I guess you can call it, the art or the science of determining evolutionary relationships between different life forms. And what it does is, well, there's several ways to, to do it. But the point behind it is that you are trying to take species and you're, you're more or less tracking backwards based on some kind of criteria, either derived traits, if you want to go with that, or even genetic similarities. What this is trying to do is it is trying to determine um, uh, the evolutionary, I guess you can call it pathway that each, each species took. And the point of it is, is to establish which species are most similar, which ones diverge from a common ancestor. So we're gonna go ahead and look at the structure of a phylogenetic tree as it's called. And I do wanna note is that this is going to seem rather intimidating. You might be saying, how are these trees made? And the answer is, is that most of them now are made by complex computer calculations. In fact, during my, my graduate research project is I actually had to make a phylogenetic tree based on the, um, the, the gene that I was focusing on. And it actually took the computer almost two days to, to calculate it. And that's because what it's doing is, it's taking the data that I put in and it's, it's more or less um, using a defined criteria such as mutation rate. It actually simulated the, um, the, the, uh, the pathway of evolution. And it did this thousands of times to come out with a consensus over what the likely pattern of evolution was. So very interesting. So if you are intimidated by this, don't be, because this is mainly done by computers nowadays. But anyways, phylogeny is, is that you are taking monophyletic groups and following it from a common ancestor. So a phylogenetic tree, we're gonna talk about how it works, but if you see here, just to kind of give, to, uh, give you an introduction, is you're seeing here that it starts with a root. And you're seeing here that this root is going to diverge into two pathways. And then these two pathways are going to diverge into two more pathways. And I'll explain what that means exactly on the next slide. So first of all, when we, when we analyze a tree, we always start with the root. And this root is the suspected common ancestor. Now you might be saying, well, why isn't it given a name? And the answer is, is we don't always know the common ancestor. This is suspected. This can um, be at times a hypothesis. And as I said, this is all based on very complex computer calculations. These are mainly hypotheses. They're not always set in stone and hypotheses as we know could be wrong. But at the very beginning, this is called the root and the root is the common ancestor between um, uh, all the current species here. Now at the point where it branches, this means that something called speciation occurred. And, and speciation is when um, one species, and we'll talk about this more in the next chapter, something happens and one, one species splits into two. Now, the length of the branch determines time. This is the time that the species continued more or less unchanged. And then here we see that we had another branch. So I don't know if I said this before, but the node is the, is the part where, where speciation occurs. And we see here that um, speciation occurred here again and then at the very end of the tree, we see the present species. So we suspect that this common ancestor diverged and became, and became an orangutan and some other primate-like animal. 
this primate like like animal speciated and became a gorilla and another common ancestor. Then this common ancestor diverged into a chimpanzee and a human. So based on this, we can see that the chimpanzee and human diverged from a common ancestor, meaning that they are the two most similar species based on the, the criteria here. And this is also why we can say that humans are not as genetically similar to, to, to gorillas because they're because they, they have another common ancestor separating them. So we have to go two, one ancestor back. Well, actually you can say two, two ancestors back in order to find out when chimpanzees, humans and gorillas were the same, same species. We also see from here that humans and chimpanzees are not nearly as, as genetically similar to the orangutan. So more or less, the more common ancestors th there are between the present species, then the less similar they are as far as, as, as revolutionary pathway. So once again, we see from here that a common ancestor speciated and became the present day, day orangutan and another species that is, that is, is unknown. This species became a a gorilla and another common ancestor or, or ancestral species, then this ancestral species became a chimpanzee and a human. The reason why we don't know this exactly is because as you can see here, this is a scale of millions of years, meaning that this ancestral species became a chimpanzee and a human basically, it looks like here between six and seven years ago. So it isn't exactly like we can just um, find a picture of it somewhere. Also, some students ask whether or not it matters when an ancestral species diverges into two other species, whether or not it matters um, the order, and it, it doesn't. So they can be flipped and it's, it's not gonna matter. So next we have another tutorial and a, and a, a lineage is following the descendants through time. And then it terminates at a node where the ancestral species diverges into two. Now this isn't common, but this one is based on shared, shared characteristics. And the red dot signifies the appearance of a shared characteristic. And we'll talk about that more. But this is another tutorial you can kind of look at if you are still unclear on the process. Um, now, if we are going to base a phylogenetic tree on, on uh, common traits, and keep in mind, this is, I guess you can say, the old way of doing it. Because what you are doing is you are, you are taking in, and, in ancestral species and you are looking for a trait. And when, when, when speciation occurs, this trait actually becomes more evolved or better for survival. So what we can do is look at, it, at an ancestral species and we can see the difference between that, that species and the current species. So what we see here on this is we're seeing that um, the ancestral species does have a mouth, but it does not have jaws. When, when speciation occurred, is jaws appeared, which of course is better than just a gaping mouth, right? So a derived trait comes from an ancestral trait. So you can kind of uh, look at it like um, the classic movie Terminator 2 Judgment Day, for those of you that have seen it, is the is the T, the, gosh, I think it's the T-800, which was the, uh, the Arnold Schwarzenegger Terminator, was uh, more ancestral to the T-1000 liquid metal, which was the more evolved Terminator. I know that's not an example that many of you know of, but you can also look at things like um, computers. Ooh, phones. So the old uh, flip phone was the ancestral species to the current smartphone. 
we see that the, the difference between it is computing power, screen size, ability to connect to the internet. Fun fact on smartphones, the phone feature is actually just an app on it. So the, so the smartphone is really a smart device because the phone feature is just an app. So, so derived traits um, uh, um, arise from ancestral traits. So if we look here, we see that this root here is the common ancestor to all these current, current species. So we see that um, speciation occurred here at this, at this node. And this um, uh, ancestral species diverged into the hagfish. And then we believe that jaws appeared here once speciation occurs. So the hagfish does not have jaws. We think that jaws appeared here and then this ancestral species diverged again into the perch and some other ancestral species. And during this, this time, during this time when speciation occurred, this common ancestor here developed lungs. So, so once again, when speciation occurred here at this node is this ancestral species became a perch and some other ancestral species. But during this time, it evolved lungs. So this an ancestral species diverged into a salamander. And when speciation occurred again at this node, then it also diverged into, a, into another ancestral species. And we, we, we believe that in this pathway here, claws and nails evolved. So we see here that this node, this ancestral species diverged into a lizard and also another um, an ancestral species. Now, now this one is, is interesting here is that when, when speciation occurred here, it did not occur in the common lineage, it occurred exclusively to birds. And then um, uh, this pathway here is that fur evolved in this ancestral species. And then this ancestral species diverged into the mouse and the chimp. So this is one that is based on common traits or shared traits. So the reason why the chimp is at the very end here is that it actually has all of these, these features here, um, except for feathers. So what we think here is that since evolution is based on the accumulation of traits, and um, we think that the hagfish was the simplest um, uh, species that diverged from the ancestral species. And we think that um, uh, chimp and mice actually were, um, were actually the result of speciation that occurred not that long ago. So once again here, and you're probably saying, well, why is it that one pathway of speciation res results in a, in a current species and the other results in an ancestral species? Well, that's because we're not sure what this, what th this, other, this other organism was that, um, that was also the result of, of speciation, which is why we continue down this main line here. Speciation kept on occurring. We're just not sure what this ancestral species was. And this is not, this is more of a teaching tool here. It is not really a realistic um, uh, uh, phylogenetic tree, but it just is to, is to show a concept. So we, we want to see how far removed the chimp and the hagfish are. If we count the nodes, one, two, three, four, five, six, that means that speciation occurred six times between the hagfish and the chimp. Since, since speciation takes a long time to happen, as we'll talk about in the, the, in the next one, um, you're, you're gonna see that it takes a long time, which is why these species are so separate from each other. Okay, so this is based on shared traits. And now what else can you base phylogenetic trees on? And the other thing you can do is based on a concept called homology. Now, if we look here, 
and we are are trying to build a phylogenetic tree based on based on um, um, homology. What we are looking for is very similar anatomical structures um, uh, that are shared between between different species. Now let's look here at a panda, a chimpanzee, a human, and, and gorilla, the anatomical structures of their hands. We see here that they share the shapes of many bones, even though the function of these, of these up, up, up appendages is slightly different. So we see that in, in pandas is that uh, they evolved a false thumb but we see here that this common ancestor diverged into chimpanzees, humans, and gorillas. And you see that they all have opposable thumbs. So what, what we can see here is based on the similarity of the bones and the shape and structure of the bones that they are genetically similar. And why is that? Because our genetics determine what, what structures are made and of course how they look. So this is strong evidence that um, these three um, species are incredibly uh, genetically similar because their DNA must be must be uh, must be be similar to create bones uh, bone structures that look so similar. Now, if we look here, is homologous structures do not always perform the same function. The structure might be very similar, but the function is not. So if we look at the at the uh, some of, of the arm bones shared between um, humans, cats, whales, and bats, we see that the shape of the bones and the structure of them is actually very similar, where there are two bones here plus a series of wrist bones. We see that the human, the cat, the whale, and the bat share a similar structure, even if the bones are a slightly different size. And what this shows us is that since the bone structures are so similar, this shows us that this must be the result of, of speciation. At one time, these four um, species were at one time a common species. And, and homologous structures is very strong evidence of, of evolution because what else is uh, the explanation for um, species that have very similar anatomical structures? The only way that makes sense is that if we're, if we're gonna follow the accepted theory of evolution and the concept of speciation, at one time they were the same species. That's the only thing that can explain why their bone structures are so similar. So we can use these to build a phylogenetic tree, a simple one. So we assume here again that pandas, chimpanzees, humans, and gorillas were at one time the same species. We see here that pandas are kind of the outgroup. They're kind of the, the outlier here because they're the only ones that do not have opposable thumbs. Whereas the chimpanzee, humans, and gorillas do. So it makes sense that this common ancestor diverged into the panda and another ancestral species, this ancestral species diverged into a chimpanzee, human, and gorilla. There is one thing that I do want to make clear, and this is analogous structures. And this is why you can't just look at, at different organisms and say, well, they look similar. So that must mean that they are, um, uh, they are um, um, closely related. Now, Analogous structures are a bit different because they have a similar function and outside appearance, but, uh, uh, but anatomically, they are not similar at all, which tells us that they actually evolve independently of each other due to what's called um, selective pressure. So this is just an, ex an example here. If a common ancestor, well, actually, this is a terrible e example because it's showing that they're only one removed. We're going to go ahead and ignore this one. But on the next, but on here, we see that if, if we were to take sharks, penguins, and dolphins, they are actually different classifications. Dolphins are mammals, penguins are birds, sharks are fish. But why is it that they all have a similar appearance? Why is it that they all have long bodies, 
fins, and then um, um, uh, in, in this case, some sort of a tail. And the answer is, is called selective pressure, which basically means that in a certain environment, there's really only one type of phenotype or appearance um, that can thrive. And if you don't have this general appearance, then your chances of survival are going to be less. Think of it like airplanes. Would you want to ride on an airplane that is shaped like a brick? Probably not, because you know the chances of success in that are very slim. All planes, depending on what kind of plane they are, have a similar appearance. Because that's the only type of uh, structure that can fly well. So anything that does not have this general appearance is going to have a hard time surviving. That's why you don't see whales with legs anymore. It would be a terrible, terrible um, um, uh, uh, way to thrive in an oceanic environment. But the reason why we, we know that the species are not closely related is if you look at their bone, bone structures, they're dramatically different. We see that dolphins actually have a bone, bone structure very similar to these other, other mammals here. And we see that um, the shark doesn't even have anything closely related to the penguin and, and dolphin. So what this tells us is that these, these, uh, these, these adaptations evolve independently of each other. And we call this convergent evolution, meaning that, um, meaning that, that even though they have similar appearance, they actually are not closely related because we see here that dolphin is actually more genetically similar to the puma, even though they don't have the same appearance. So appearance does not always equal uh, genetic similarity. So that is called convergent evolution, where they actually evolve independently of each other, but they have a similar appearance due to selective pressure. Because anything that does not look like um, uh, the, these, these organisms in an aquatic environment are, are going to have a harder time surviving. So one other thing that we need to talk about is something called an outgroup. So let's say that you are, you are trying to analyze a common lineage. And if we look here, is let's say that, that we want to see all of the um, uh, current species that evolve from, from this ancestral species. So by doing this, by, by focusing on this common ancestor here, we're basically ig ignoring the, the lineage that turned into the um, lamprey. We call this the outgroup. So anything that is, that is not involved in our focus is called an outgroup. And more or less, it's our control, so to speak. It is our basis for comparison. Even though we're not including the lamprey in our, in our pathway uh, of evolution, we're still using it as a baseline. So more or less, we know that even though this common ancestor diverged into the lamprey, we're not really, really uh, focusing on it. We're focusing on these, these current species here. But the lamprey is the point of, cons of comparison because um, as we talked about in the, in the last slide that looked very similar, um, this one here, is we're seeing that all of these, these current species here, they have accumulated traits past the lamprey. So what this does is it, is it tells us, okay, well, the lamprey has none of these um, structures here, jaws, lungs, claws, nails, fur. So what we are, are doing is, we're, is we're, we're, we're taking a far removed species and seeing how similar or dissimilar the current species are to or the the uh, the in group species are compared to to the out group, so it kind of functions as a control, and the in group are all the species we're including in our analysis. You don't have to have an out group, but it does help to have a basis of comparison. Now, the other way to to um, 
to determine species relatedness, which is actually the most accurate, is to use molecular data. And this one is kind of a simple one, is, and this is a table that you should be familiar with on the exam, is counting the number of amino acid differences between cytochrome C, which is a gene in the mitochondria, among various organisms. Now, there is something called a mutation rate, meaning that over time, the more generations happen, mutations are going to accumulate that's going to result in new phenotypes. And keep in mind, this takes hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years for an accidental mutation. Well, I'm sorry, they're all accidental to result in a slightly altered genetic code that makes a different functional protein. As we talked about, most mutations result in a protein that is no longer functional. So what we do here is we compare the row to the column in order to see how many differences in the amino acid sequence result that are, uh, remember that the process of translation reads codons and uh, places in a inappropriate uh, amino acid that the codon um, uh, specifies. So what the assumption is, is that since the mutation rate can be kind of calculated, is that the more mutations there are between different species, then the longer it's been since, since speciation occurred. Meaning the more differences, the more time it's been since the species were, um, were uh, shared a common ancestor. So of course the horse to the horse is zero differences. The horse to the donkey though, there's only one amino acid difference between the horse and the donkey. So if we look here between the horse and the chicken, there's 11, the penguin 13 and the snake 21 differences. Now, if we go to the donkey, very similar here, is a uh, donkey has zero, but 10, 12 and 20 with chicken, penguin and snake respectively. The chicken too, there's only three amino acids um, uh, differences with the penguin, but 18 with the snake. And we see the penguin here has 17 differences with the snake. So if we look here, we see that the snake is actually our, can be our out group because none of the species here are genetically similar to the snake. So what we do is that when we build our roots, we know that the snake, since it's so dissimilar from the other species and shares so many, uh, so many um, amino acid differences between all of them, this tells us that a speciation occurred and then the pathway stopped. So if we're using these five species to build a phylogenetic tree, the snake has to have its own lineage because there's so many amino acid differences between the snake and the other four species, it's very hard to say that at one time, um, uh, or, they, or they shared a recent ancestor. That would be a very hard uh, assumption to go on. So we know here that the snake um, evolved long, long before the penguin, chicken, donkey, and horse. Hmm. So what we are going to do here now is this is the root. Speciation occurred and became the snake and another common ancestor. So what, so what we can do here is say, well, OK, the chicken and the penguin actually have many amino acid differences from the donkey and the horse. So we know here that the penguin and the, the chicken since there are so few differences between them, we know that when, when, when speciation occurred and um, the, the snake evolved and, and an ancestral species, we can assume that the chicken and the penguin, um, uh, speciation occurred again and the chicken and the penguin uh, evolved from, from, this, from this common ancestor. Now the donkey and the horse. So we see here that they're actually the most recently evolved species because the donkey and the horse, it's, since there's only one amino acid difference, we assume that not much time has gone on since speciation occurred. 
Plus, donkeys and horses can actually make viable offspring called a mule. But the reason why donkeys and horses are not the same, same species anymore is because uh, one criteria for a, for a species is that um, they must have, um, they must be able to create fertile offspring and mules are all sterile. So that's why donkeys and horses are no longer considered members of the, of the, of the same species. Now you're probably saying, well, how do we know that the penguin and the chicken are older than the donkey and the horse? Why is it placed earlier on the phylogenetic tree? Well, the reason why is because there's so many differences between the chicken and penguin and the donkey and horse is that, is that we assume that they're not, they're, they don't share a common ancestor. There are a couple common ancestors re removed. And you're also saying, well, but, but how do we still know? Well, based on current data, we, is, we uh, strongly believe that mammals evolved uh, not that long ago on the evolutionary scale. This is why we placed them on the most, um, most recent uh, of all these, these species here to, 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 to speciate. As we talked about with the different eras during the last um, chapter we talked about, is we talked about how reptiles evolve first. So what we're doing here is we are using amino acid differences to determine how long it's been since all these species were a common ancestor. Once again, since the snake has so many differences between the other four um, species, we assume that the last time they shared a common ancestor was long ago. Um, uh, the chicken and penguin only have three amino acid differences but the chicken and penguin share many, uh, many amino acid differences with the horse and donkey. So what that tells us is that it's been a while since the horse, donkey, chicken, and penguin were the same, same species, which is why that we branch off here and we show that the chicken and the penguin evolved from a common ancestor. That's the only thing that explains why they have so few, few amino acid differences. And we assume here that the donkey and horse speciated from a common ancestor, because that's the only thing that can explain why there's only one amino acid um, uh, difference between them. And you won't have to draw these. You might have to label it, but you don't have to draw these. So these, these will already be here. You may have to label or identify, but you won't need to draw it. So this one here, we have three possible phylogenetic trees. And we're trying to determine which one is most accurate. So which one is the correct phylogenetic tree based on these four species? So what we do is, this is a genetic code. What we're pretty much doing is we are going to count the number of amino acid differences between these species. So I'm going to start with species one here. Now, when we if, if, if we're going to do species two and count the, the differences, so let's see. So at position one, there's an A and a G. So that is one difference in this gene sequence between uh, species one and species two, so one. At position two, they're the same. At position three, they're different, two. At four, they're the same. Five, they're different. They're different. That's three differences. And at six and seven, they're the same. So species two, there's three differences. Species three, let's count here. One difference at position one, two differences here. Same three, four. So there's four differences between species one and species uh, three. Now species four, if we're gonna count here, one difference, two, three, four. So there's also four differences between species four and species one. So we're seeing here already that species one actually is most closely related to species two. Okay, so let's go now to species two. And species one, we know that there's only three, three differences because we just did this. Species um, uh, three, 
So if we look here, one, two, three, four, five. So there's five differences between species three and species four, and, and species two, sorry. Species two to four, we have one, two, three, four. So there's also four differences between species two and species four. So we're seeing so far, it's pretty clear that species one and species two are very similar. So we're gonna go here now. So we already kind of have an idea. So species three, um, uh, uh, species one to species three, we know that there's three. Um, species three to species two, we know that there's five. And now if we're, we're gonna do species three to species four, one, two, three. So, so there's only three between um, species three and species four. Wait, what am I doing here? I wanted species two and species, uh, species two and species three. So there's five, yeah, okay. Wait, no, what am I doing? Species two, here we go. Not the best way to do the chart, but here we are. All right, now we're gonna do species four. So we don't even have to count it because, because we have all the data here. So species four, we know the difference between species one and species four is four. Species two to species four is four. Species three to species four is three. So based on this, we know here that species one is most similar to species three. Species two is most similar to species four. So if we look at this, um, uh, at these options here, we can say that, okay, based on these, these differences in gene sequence, since species one and species three have the fewest differences, then it makes sense that they diverge from a common ancestor. When, um, and since, since species three and species four have the, have the fewest amounts of differences, then it's fair to say that they shared the most recent common ancestor. And that there, there's actually two ancestors rem removed between um, species one and two, and species three and four, actually one, um, two, yeah. So there are so so there are two ancestors removed from species one and species, from species one, species two, and then species three, species four. Okay, so this is the field of phylogeny, and we're seeing here that you can base it on either common traits or you can base it on um, gene sequences. Once again, is that gene sequences are the most accurate because they are um, based on a set mutation rate. And plus there's really no way for, for there to be, be similar DNA sequences unless they were at one time um, the same species, which is identified by a common ancestor. All right, well, hope you guys enjoyed this lecture. And next up is going to be speciation. Over and out.